Negotiating. What comes to mind when you hear that word? Anxiety. Pressure. Loudest voice wins. There's a problem with all these ideas. We tend to see negotiation as a win lose proposition. And most of us fit into one of the two stereotypes the soft person that avoids conflict at all costs and quickly gives in. Or in the other extreme, the aggressive person who does damage to the relationships and gets their way. There's a serious flaw, though. Negotiation is not zero sum. Someone doesn't have to lose for the other person to win. This week's book proposes a better way to handle conflict. Separate people from the problem and focus on interests, not positions. Invent options for mutual gain and insist on objective criteria. Let's dive into getting the yes, negotiating agreement without giving in. Welcome back. You're listening to Motivation Minute, where we unravel the timeless truths in a stack of books you've been wanting to read so that you don't have to. This week's book is Getting to Yes, Negotiating Agreement Without Giving In by Roger Fisher and William Urey. And you know, Jariah, this is the book that I read like three years ago or four years ago, and I never finished. Really? Until I decided to skim it tonight. Oh, interesting. And it worked out great following the Motivation Minute checklist, which if you just read the intro conclusion and skim every first sentence of the paragraphs in between, you get the whole book. Nice. And that's how I could finish the book. I got hung up in like three quarters through and never got through it the first time I read it. Like five years ago, you said? It was like four or five years ago, I think now. Wow. But the great thing is this book still has stuck with me in those four or five years, even though I never finished it, which is really? pretty cool. Like how to negotiate or... Or what exactly have you, you used it, the principles for? Well, it's mostly negotiation, how you think of it. Uh, what the book brings up is this concept of principled negotiation. So we brought up in the quick summary that there's like the soft and hard negotiator types. Okay. Typically, we're not looking for a win-win. It's win-lose when we're negotiating. Yeah. This book is different. It brings up that you can negotiate hard and soft looking for mutual win-win. Okay. So hard and soft being like aggressive negotiation and also agreeable and, you know. Yeah, like empathetic. Yeah, empathetic. It's, so it's like you get the aggressive on the problem where you look at the merits of the problem first, not the person, and then you're soft on the people where you're empathetic with them. Oh, interesting. Okay. So yeah, the idea that in, a, in any negotiation, it's, it should work out for both people. But I, I, and I guess that is the definition of negotiation, but I guess a lot of times it turns out to an argument or where one person gets their way and one doesn't and yeah. feels victimized or, or um, you know, taken advantage of. And the other, normally the mean, aggressive person gets his way, you know, but both people aren't happy, I guess. <laughs> and it's often because we're not listening. Hmm. It's the... One major point the book brought up over and over again was put yourself in the other person's shoes hmm. and don't blame them for your problem. See, that's the thing. We tend to think of when you're negotiating with someone about something, you're, you're negotiating them with them, which makes you feel like you're negotiating against them, but you're not. Hmm. You both have a goal. And so you, you need to figure out what is that goal for both of you and mutually agree on that versus just fight each other because negotiation isn't fighting it's working together to find mm. that common yeah. ground the whole point of, of negotiating is when you know when both people are trying to, to achieve something or maybe sometimes there's a conflict and then both people need to, to work it out together and it said you don't instead of focusing on positions like hey this is this is my the way i see it and then versus the way you see it but instead you should focus on interests like Kind of yeah. what's, what are we interested in achieving? What's the goal here? You know, the goal from the beginning, you should probably clarify like, hey, we're both trying to do this. Let's see if we can do that. Not I'm doing this and, you know, and I don't like what you're doing, right? You get in that he said, she said mentality yeah. if, you, if you're getting into the relationship, which that's the thing. We confuse the relationship with the problem. And what it, what it kind of boils down to is put the relationship first and value that above the problem. Like it doesn't really matter what's going on 
with the problem. I care about the relationship first. Huh. Uh, the book brought up get other people involved early because if you don't, they'll be predisposed to think negatively of you. And that's a good point. So like at work, we have several teams I work with. And uh, one of them is the quality assurance group and the other is the configuration management group. They have okay. two important roles. Hmm. QA handles all of you know making sure we follow our processes okay cm makes sure that we document and uh keep track of all the versions of our code and the problem is we leave them out of meetings too often and i got talking to qa and cm people in the last couple months as i was working with them and figured out it's a problem if you leave them out because they have an important role that we have to recognize but they're not the first people we're thinking about it because it's we're thinking about the problem, mm. not about them, but they take it as against them if we don't include them in the discussion. Yeah, but because, and they have a good say about the problem that we need to yeah, think about. They're a part of they have they're they're in, they're in the in the process of of fixing problems, right? So they have right. So if, yeah, if you don't put people in the loop, it's kind of like just communication, right? Yeah, I, I see it in politics, I guess, a lot, and I find myself doing it too. But where I'm like, instead of we, we always say, oh, this person over here this liberal or that you know right wing guy or instead of just saying focus on the what what are the actual issues we're talking about not attacking people directly cuz i mean politics isn't about or i mean the underlying principles don't have anything to do with people but then we make it about people and then then all the arguments break out in <laughs> in politics and everything i like that point because actually when you think about the internet age it gives us this interface to interact where we don't actually see each other face to face. So we're more predisposed to fight each other yeah. like person to person versus on an issue. Exactly. Like if we were to sit back and actually listen to the other perspective, um, like on both sides, we'd actually find somewhere in the middle, but we instead just keep, you know, fighting constantly yeah. at each other without even bothering to sit and listen. And that's the thing this book brings is take the time to listen because, and, and actually invite criticism of your ideas. Mm. That's another thing this book said. It was, you know, don't just defend your ideas, like trying to be a hard negotiator, which that's tough to do. You want to defend your ideas. You want to think you're thinking about things correctly, mm. but it's, it's more like, don't worry about solving everything in one fell swoop. Come up with a draft solution to both of your problems have you mutually critique it and then improve it yeah. piece by piece? Yeah, it's that arguing over positions is completely ineffective, um, and it endangers yeah. dangers the ongoing relationship, and and it never works. You can never you never win somebody. I realize though by logic, um, like by just I mean purely by logic, giving all the facts. You know, these are like that doesn't convince people. Like like we talked about in other books about the emotion of you have to somehow create an emotion. It doesn't matter what you say. It's like you got to create, create a connection and create that feeling or the, and that's how you, how you sell or negotiate and not, not by listing all your facts and then arguing. Right. Yeah. And people are more likely to listen when you listen to them or they're more, yeah. more likely to feel that emotion right. when you actually hear them out. When you listen, even if even if you don't agree with what you're, they're saying at all, I f I think I've realized I, that I need to just like listen anyway and let them finish all their points and be like, hey, yeah, you know, those are, those are good points, you know, hey, uh, you know, maybe, but you know, what about this, you know, how yeah, about, how about this perspective, you know? And that was a tool the book brought up using questions to reflect back what they're saying because you don't have to agree on everything. It gives you the comeback. Mm. When you don't have a good response to something you disagree on, you just ask a question and that actually opens it up to say, hey, I'm being a little bit vulnerable here and let's figure out where is the middle. Yeah. Another point I really liked in this book was this principle called BATNA, which stands for best alternative to a negotiated agreement. And what is that? Well, it's kind of like you got to think about your edge cases. Like, what if I don't get what I'm negotiating for? This is the thing we don't like to think about because we want to stay in control of the negotiation. But the thing is, if you have a better alternative to your negotiation, that actually gives you extremely good negotiation power. 
Hmm. Like if you have a backup plan, that's really good. Okay. You ever had that happen? Um, you mean where, like, let's say it gets to a point where they, they're just like, nope, we're not interested on the, you instead of just like being stumped, fighting back or fighting back and or being stumped like, Oh, I guess this, like to actually have, um, more options available kind of, or like, more. yeah, like that, or, you know, walk away knowing you have a better idea uh, or you have a very good alternative that you could pursue instead. Okay. Hmm. So wait, so is that for the point of having another reason or is it basically, well, I guess having another option available or not putting too much stake and caring too much about the yes. problem will make you more relaxed or confident? That's that- a lot of it. So if you if there's less stress in the whole situation, then there's a lot less pressure to get it right the first time. Hmm. So that'll make you more successful because you have more leeway. Yeah, that makes perfect sense because yeah, I've found that if you yeah, if, if you're doing something where you just care so much and you have so much stake in in the in it in an argument or in a, in a debate or something or or in anything, if you care so much, then that's going to make you really tense and it's going to make you not not be calm and collected and it's going to actually make you not get what you want if you come from a place of of need and desperation or whatever but if you can have that if you can take it more calm and be like you know it's not that big of a deal if i right. don't end up getting what i want even if you if it is really important if you can somehow can think in your mind like okay i'm not going to feel i'm going to f- pretend like it's not a big as big of a deal and then i feel like even in sales to the customer that shows them that you're like you know you're you're not you're not you're not depending on them for all like you know you're it's they you, people can sense that if you're you put everything into this one sale or this one thing they're not going to want to work with you if they sense that because you'll be so pushy because of that but if you have like a backup plan like you said or something that can definitely help with that right yeah i had this happen when i was searching for a job because uh i i had a point where i got my first job offer after my first interview it was like a, a week afterward and I was thinking, huh, I wonder if I should go for this because I have no other option right now. It was like a couple months after I graduated college. And I'm like, hmm. well, if I wait, I don't know what the future holds. If I take this one, now it wasn't really something I exactly wanted, mm-hmm. but it was close sort of to what I wanted. So I was like, well, maybe that's better than you know not having something. Okay. So that was a case where I had to learn the... Batna idea where you want the best alternative, which my alternative was go for something else by using the same process I had been doing to apply to jobs and to, you know, interview the same way I'd been interviewing, get better at the art of doing it, get better at networking. I chose the alternative. And that was powerful because later I had three interviews over the course of a week and got two job offers out of that. In that process, I accepted one of the offers. But because I had two offers, that made it a lot more negotiable mm. in my head. Like mm. I wasn't completely dependent on them yep. at that point. Like yep. I had choice. Yep. And I could make a very educated decision. Really? Yeah. A more educated decision and it showed them probably or they sensed it from you that, you know, you weren't just like begging them, please give me the job. Yes. It's not like yeah, it's not a one way thing at that point. It's like, well, You'll have to do something to make yours a lot more appealing than, than this other one I have. And I liked them both right. in a lot of ways. I yep. didn't know what to expect about either of them. But there was one that leaned a little bit better than the other. Right. But you know, it was the approach of not accepting that first one months before that was the only one I had at that time that seemed yeah. like, well, is it better to have a job or not have a job? Well, yep. it's better to have the right job. Yeah. And using that best next alternative yep. is a good way to do it. Okay, so my number one takeaway from this book is never yield to pressure, only yield when the process is right mm. and stick to your standards. It's a big deal because I don't like tension generally. For example, if I'm negotiating with someone like like last year when I bought a Honda Civic, that night I couldn't fall asleep for at least a couple hours because my brain was just in this hyper overdrive from negotiating, which is not a thing I that's my default. 
I, I prefer to be on an ongoing relationship with people that yeah. they understand me or that we we mutually know what our goals are and it's like a very natural thing to have a discussion, not a one-off someone's going to win tonight kind mm. of thing. I mean, in this book, it's everybody's going to win, yeah. but still it feels yeah. like somebody's going to win and you want to make yeah. sure you're winning in some way. So huh. what I got out of this book was don't yeah. just give in when you have pressure. Keep it up. Keep encouraged. And then when the time is right, you give in when it follows the process that, that you've decided is right. Mm. Yeah, I'd say that could be my takeaway too um, along that line of that's one thing I need to work on is instead of thinking like I need to get it done right now, get the negotiation done. If you, you know, if you sleep on it or take time um, and talk about it continually, like you said, then you can come to a, a better, actually a better deal probably. And, yeah. Um, but, you know, sometimes people will use the um, scarcity thing, you know, like, oh, it's only a deal. That's why they have those things where it's like only available today. So people can't do that. Yep. We can't take the time to think about it. <laughs> that's like, oh, I better. And that's right not now. a win-win unless you desperately needed that vacuum yeah. today. But usually you don't. And most of the time, those, those things are not even, they're fake. They're just a sales thing. Oh, it's only available for this long, you know. And those things can even be negotiated if you're a good negotiator. like <laughs> Right. So that's cool. I, I really enjoyed this book. Even after reading it several years ago, skimming it was a very good experience. You should try skimming this book if you haven't already, listeners. And also, check out our website, motivationminute.com, to see all the books we've covered and that checklist so that you can learn how to skim a book like I did. And leave us a review on iTunes. That would really help us out. Just go to our website and click on review and we would really appreciate it. So thank you for listening and we'll see you next week.